ligado? Tá. O negócio é seguro, né? Tá.
Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Dear researchers, good morning. Welcome to the opening ceremony of the Brazil-Japan Joint Research Workshop on Adhesive Dentistry. This event is a common effort of both Japanese and Brazilian coordinators and was supported by both Japanese and Brazilian funding, research funding agencies. On behalf of the organizing committee, we'd like to extend our warmest welcome to all the researchers attending this meeting who came from the most important institutions of this country and our special greetings to the Japanese researchers who came a long, long way to honor us with your presence, your research, and your knowledge. Thank you very much. This is a two-day event beginning today, October 31st, and ending tomorrow, November 1st. The main lectures of the event, what we call the mentors' lectures, will happen today and tomorrow, and we're going to meet these mentors in a few moments. First, uh, we'd like to thank the research funding agencies of the event from Brazil, FAPESP, Sao Paulo Research Foundation, and from Japan, GSPS, the, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Yet, we'd like to thank Piracicaba Dental School of the University of Campinas uh, to welcome, to host, and support this meeting. Thank you so much for the institution. Piracicaba Dental School celebrates this year 60 years, six years, and this meeting is certainly a very, very nice way to welcome the celebration. This workshop has 299 attendants, 10 oral presentations, 10, uh, 80 poster presentations, 28 young Brazilian researchers, and 10 young Japanese researchers. The young researchers were selected based on the impact and originality of their studies. And these are the award categories of the event. We have awards for the oral presentation for both Brazilian and Japan presenters, the poster presentation for the young researchers, graduate student, postdoc, faculty, and professional. We're going to ask you to, uh, that the poster presentation will always be at the end of the day, from 5 to 6 p.m., and there will not be a formal presentation, but we do have evaluators. So we encourage all the presenters to be next to their posters from five to six, so the participants could interact with your research, okay? On this occasion, I will introduce and invite the authorities, coordinators, the Japanese and Brazilian mentors to come forward to compose this board. The first one to be called is Dr. Guilherme Elias Pessan Henriquez, the Dean of Piracicaba Dental School, University of Campinas. Please, Dr. Uh, Guilherme, welcome. <laughs> Dr. Francisco Reiter Neto, the Associate Dean of Piracicaba Dental School from University of Campinas, who could not be here today. Dr. Luis Roberto Marcondes Martins, the chair of the Department of Restorative Dentistry of Piracicaba Dental School, University of Campinas, please welcome. <laughs> Dr. Cynthia Tabachuri, the coordinator of the graduate programs of Piracicaba Dental School, University of Campinas. Welcome, Professor. Dr. Regina Pupin Rontani, the coordinator of dental material graduate program of Piracicaba Dental School, University of Campinas. Welcome. <laughs> and Dr. Karina Ruiz, the coordinator of graduate program in clinical dentistry of Piracicaba Dental School. Welcome as well. <laughs> now, I have the honor to invite the coordinators to compose this board. Dr. Marcelo Giannini from Piracicaba Dental School, University of Campinas. Please welcome, Professor. <laughs> uh, 
And our special guest, Dr. Junji Tagami from Tokyo Medical and Dental University. Welcome, Professor. Now I'd like to call the Brazilian mentors to compose this board and come forward. Dr. Cynthia Tabshuri, that is already here. Dr. André Figueiredo Reis from University of Guarulhos from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Please. He's there. <laughs> Dr. Roberto Ruggiero Braga from University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Thank you, Professor. And now I have the honor to present the Japanese mentors, Dr. Toru Makaido from Tokyo Medical and Dental University in Japan. <laughs> Dr. Atsushi Mini from Osaka University, Japan. <laughs> Dr. Noriyuki Nagaoka from University of Okayama, Japan. Once more, we'd like to reaffirm the honor of having the Japanese coordinator and all the Japanese mentors with us and the Brazilian coordinators and uh, mentors. Thank you for coming on. Please have a seat. It is time now to present the, uh, the Brazilian young researchers who were selected to come and present at this meeting. At the end of this list, I'm going to ask you to stand so we can give you a round of applause. From University of Campinas, Carolina Bossandré, Daiane Carvalho Salles de Oliveira, from University of São Paulo, Beatriz Togoro Ferreira da Silva, Carlos Alberto Kenji Shimokawa, from University of São Paulo at Bauru, Marina Sicone Giacomini, Odair Pen Jr., from University of São Paulo at Ribeirão Preto, Lorenzo de Roselino, Fabiana Almeida Zotti. Let me see. No. From São Paulo State University at Arasatuba, Rodrigo Sversut de Alexandre, Thaís Yumi Umeda Suzuki, e from University of uh, from São Paulo State University at São José dos Campos, Guilherme Saavedra, Tânia Mara da Silva, Marina Gulo Augusto. From the University uh, São Paulo State University at Araraquara. Giovanna Anovazi Medeiros, Diana Gabriela Soares. From São, po São Leopoldo Mandic uh, Dental School, sorry. Flávia Botelho do Amaral, Fernando Pelegrin Fernandes, Enrico Cosa Bridge. From University of Taubaté, Marina Amaral. From University of Santo Amaro, William Cunha Brandt, Letícia Cidreira Boaro. Regis Cleo Fernandes Graça Júnior, Michael Gomes Vidal, and from University of Guarulhos, Marina Guimarães Rosco, José Carlos Romanini Júnior, Aline de Sequeira Casas, Bruno Bueno Silva. Now I'm going to ask the Brazilian researchers, young researchers, to stand so we can give you a round of applause. Please stand so everybody can see you. Is everybody here? No? Please come forward. Thank you so much. You can have a seat. Now I call the Japanese young researchers from Tokyo Medical and Dental University, Hena Takahashi, Takaaki Sato, Juri Hayashi, from Okayama University, Akito Yokayama, Kumiko Yoshihara, Kazuhiko Shibuya, from Hokkaido University, Mariko Matsumoto, from Osaka University, Nanako Hirose, from Nihon University, Akimasa Tsushimoto, from Kagoshi, sorry, Kagoshima University, Tomohiro Hoshika. Please, uh, the Japanese young researchers at the audience, please stand so we can give you a round of applause. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Then, now I invite uh, Dr. Guilherme Elias Henrique Pensanhas, who wants to invite you all. Thank you, Professor. Good morning. Bom dia a todos. Uma satisfação enorme tê-los aqui na FOP, nesse ano em que celebramos 60 anos de existência. É, mérito do professor Marcelo Giannini, um evento deste porte, trazer a delegação japonesa e discutir em dois dias os adesivos e a odontologia adesiva. É, parabéns, professor Marcelo, por organizar um evento dessa natureza. Talking to our Japanese friends, welcome to Brazil, welcome to FOPI. Certainly, it's the first time in Brazil for most of you. It's a honor for us host this event, having you here. Welcome again. Thank you very much. Now I invite you all to stand so we can hear the national anthems of Japanese and next Brazilian anthems. Please stand and face the flags. the Brazilian National Anthem.
thank you please have thank you please thank you please have a seat now I'm going to introduce you the companies uh, that supported this event the platinum supporting companies were uh, Cora representing Curare Noritake PHS of Brazil representing Tokuyama Dental the Golden Supporting Companies, Dent Supply Sirona, GC South America, Dental Press Editors, and the Silver Supporting Companies, 3M Oral Care, Evoclare Viva Dent, Coulser, Shofu, Labor Dental. And I'm going to introduce you the facilities of the event. We are here now at the auditorium. We have a main entrance and two emergency exits that are located on the right and left of this stage. We have also an area where we're gonna have our coffee break and where the companies, the supporting companies are. The toilets are right beside this area and the poster presentations will take place on the right and left Islo, uh, right at the entrance of the university. We are also going to have uh, dining tonight and tomorrow, and we invite all the participants to attend to the, uh, this dinner tonight and tomorrow. Tom today is at Motsu, which is very close to Ibis Hotel and from Piracicaba Dental School, and tomorrow we're going to have dinner at Villa Italia, which is also very easy to get there. And here is your reference from Ibis and the university. Uh, dinner costs of Montsou is of approximately 65 reais and for Villa Italia, 90 reais. And all participants are invited to go. Once more, we'd like to thank the presence of the authorities and the authorities in, on this board and invite you to return to your seats so we can give uh, we can move forward and watch the first presentation. Thank you again for the Brazilian and Japanese members, the authorities and coordinators presented here. Thank you. Please, a round of applause. We sh wish you all a great meeting experience and we hope everyone enjoys this workshop. The ceremony is now finished, and we will move forward and begin the first presentation that will be with Dr. Junji Tagami. Thank you very much. I just like to remember all the oral presenters to upload the oral presentations uh, presentations on these two computers, one or the other. And for that, please look for Dr. Gabriel Nima. Excuse me, Dr. Gabriel Nima is also uh, named Arequipa. You can look for him, <laughs> and he will help you to upload this presentation. Okay. So now 
we have the honor to welcome Dr. Junji Tagami, who talk about the current status and future of the adhesive dentistry. Dr. Tagami is the chair of the Department of Cardiology and Operative Dentistry of the Graduate School in Medical of Medical and Dental Sciences from Tokyo Medical and Dental University in Japan. From 2005 to 2014, he was the dean of the Faculty of Dentistry to, from Tokyo Medical and Dental University. And from 2014 until the present date, he is the executive director and executive vice president, of, uh, vice president of Tokyo Medical and Dental University. Dr. Tagami has over 450 original and reviewed papers listed in PubMed, several books, honors, and memberships in a great number of professional organizations. Dr. Tagami, it's a great privilege to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Now he's going to present, and we're going to open for discussions at the end of presentation. Okay, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Junji Tagami from Tokyo Medical and Dental University. Uh, it's indeed my great honor and pleasure to be here uh, to be able to hold this workshop uh, under the collaboration with my old friend, uh, Professor Marcelo Giannini. And I thank to the Dean of the Dental uh, School of Dentistry at Piascava, Professor Guilherme, uh, for his very great support to this program. Thank you very much. And also, I thank to each of you in the audience uh, for your presence, because uh, you are honored by your presence today. Thank you very much. Uh, today, um, I'm very happy to talk about my favorite topic, that is adhesion, bonding. Um, after the graduation from my dental school, I have continued the research and education and, and clinic regarding to adhesive dentistry more than um, 35 years already. So um, I will talk about the current status and future of adhesive dentistry. Unfortunately, talking about the future is very difficult. If I can tell the future of dentistry exactly, so I cannot survive anymore. So anyhow, I try to uh, provide the information for you to be able to think about the future. And I'd like to talk about the Japanese food at first. Uh, you know, uh, this is a very special kind of fish in Japan. We enjoy the uh, so low fish sashimi. Uh, and, but this is a very special kind of fish. You know, this is blowfish. And uh, the blowfish is very well known as very strong points in some part of the body of the fish. Um, in the past time, many people died by eating this. But now, when you have a chance to come to our country, you can enjoy this fish. Nowadays, the chef to provide this special kind of fish are uh, required to hold the governmental license. So that's why it's very safe. Only a few people die every year. <laughs> okay. But anyhow, the fish is very special. The taste is special. And also, the meat is very a little bit harder. To enjoy its texture, this is usually provided with a very, very thin slices. We can enjoy the texture of the fish as well as the taste. And of course, the tuna fish is very popular. Uh, tuna fish is a uh, little bit soft, tender. That's why this is provided with much thicker slices. We can enjoy the difference of the texture of each kind of fishes. So in the field of dentistry nowadays, the implant is becoming very popular and a very excellent uh, treatment option for our patients. However, you can so imagine that all your teeth are replaced with the implant. In that case, you cannot enjoy the difference of the texture of food anymore because of the absence 
of the periodontal ligaments. Now, that's why I can emphasize the importance of the minimally invasive approach to maintain our natural teeth in our whole life long. The concept of minimal intervention was uh, recommended by the Committee of Restoration of FDI in that year 2000. They recommend to cut this kind of uh, rat race of the restorations at the early stages. However, in my country, uh, my teacher, Dr. Takao Fusayama, he established the minimally invasive restoration technique of caries in 1980, uh, and also a little bit uh, earlier than this year. year. Uh, he, at that time, he developed the caries detecting dye solution, as well as the first adhesive resin systems. So that's why he could establish this very innovative treatment technique. Now, I'd like to uh, briefly review the history of the bonding technology that is. Uh, the enamel etching was introduced by Dr. Michael Bonhoi in the year 1955. This year is very important in the history of the adhesive dentistry because I was also born in this year. I'm very old now. <laughs> and also, uh, many kind of adhesive resin monomers were developed by the Institute, at the Institute of Dr. Boyan and others. And in the year 1978, the total etching technique, that is a phosphoric acid etching technique to both enamel and dentin simultaneously. And we started the adhesive restoration with this material. Uh, it was, uh, now it is now said as the etch and rinse technique. And another very important innovation is the development of the self-hatching technology. Now, in Japan, um, most of the clinicians use the self-hatching material in the routine clinical work. So uh, this is the flow of the development of the adhesive materials. After the total etching technique, uh, light cure technology is incorporated, and the primer was uh, developed and combined to the procedures. And in 1993, we have the so-called self-etching adhesive technique. At the, almost at the same time, the so-called the wet bonding technique was uh, recommended in the case of etch and rinse technique. After that, we have the so-called the uh, one-step system, uh, one-step self-etching adhesive system. However, the quality of the bonding was not so excellent at that time. Then after that, many manufacturer and the researcher tried to develop and improve the quality of the bonding. Nowadays, in our clinic, we can enjoy, we can use the one-step self-etching adhesives. For the adhesive materials, the so-called adhesive resin monomers are very important. There are so many kinds of adhesive resin monomers developed by the manufacturers and the researchers in the world. In this uh, material, the first adhesive resin system, Crefield Bond System F, uh, in this adhesive resin material, the so-called phenyl P was utilized. And total etching, etching of dentin was necessary because we could not obtain a good bonding onto the smear layer. Smear layer should be removed by the acidic treatment. Now I'll show you a very simplified animation of the bonding mechanism in the case of etch and rinse technique. This is a dentin surface covered with a smear layer after the preparation. The phosphoric acid is very strong and very short. in a very short time the smear layer is removed and the surface of dentin is demineralized. The collagen layer is exposed here and after rinse and drying, the collagen layer shrinks. Because of the shrinkage, the space 
in the layer becomes so small. That's why the bonding resin cannot penetrate into this layer so well. After the light curing, of course, we could observe the hybrid layer formation. However, at the bottom of the hybrid layer, there is just the layer of collagen, collagen without penetration of the bonding resin. That's why this uh, space becomes the weak point at the in bonding interface afterwards. In my department, we could accumulate the result of the bond test, uh, mainly by mainly the product by Kurare Noritake companies from 1970s and up to now. But at first, for the first material, the bond strength to denting was like this, very lo low compared to the recent materials. However, in 1970s, we didn't have a good adhesive resin material. It was one of the best material. And when the adhesive resin monomer was changed from phenyl P to the MDP, the bond strength became two times higher. This is phenyl P and MDP. Now this 10 MDP is recognized as the best adhesive resin monomer in the world. At the time, people expected to have this kind of chemical reaction with hydroxy apatite, but unfortunately at that time there was no facility uh, to analyze this kind of reaction. And after the um, light curing um, catalyst uh, was developed, again, the bone strength became very high. And also, by the application of the primer, the bone strength became so high. However, these materials show the fracture at the bone interface between resin and dentin when we test it. But after the development of the self-etching materials, um, mostly all of the specimens show the cohesive failure in dentin when we test the bond, bonding, bond strength. So that's why we could not obtain the bond strength value more than 20 megapascal with this kind of conventional test method. That's why we needed to develop the testing method named as microtensile test or micro shear test. Okay. Now I'd like to summarize the elements of the adhesive systems. Of course, the tooth surface treatment is necessary to remove the smear layer. And by the surface treatment, the material, bonding material, can penetrate into the surface of enamel and dentin. Then uh, the adhesive resin monomer is believed to be very important to, for the bonding resin to infiltrate into the surface of the two, su two substances. Also, uh, nowadays we can expect some chemical reaction of these adhesive resin monomers with the hydroxy apatite. Also, the matrix resin monomer in the bonding resin is very important to make, uh, sometimes to make the bonding resin infiltrated into the surface of the tooth, as well as to create the very make uh, strong uh, bond layers. Of course, as a matrix resin monomers, um, we can utilize the so-called hydrophilic monomers and the hydrophobic monomers. Of course, the catalyst is another very important uh, ingredient. Okay, then through the 30 or 40 years in the history of the development of adhesive materials. So everybody um, tried to increase, uh, improve the penetration of the bonding resin into enamel and dentin. Then after that, that bonding resin should be polymerized to create a very strong layer of the bonding. And also, uh, we can expect some chemical reaction between the adhesive resin material and tooth substance. In the case of the so-called wet bonding technique in H and rinse technique, 
we try to uh, evaluate the weak point at the bond interface. This is the composite resin, and this is bonding resin layer, and this is the hybrid layer, and this is dentin. We immerse this kind of specimen into the silver nitrate solution for one night. Then the silver nitrate solution can penetrate into the space at the interface. After that, we try to uh, detect the amount of the silver penetrate into this interface. The amount of silver is uh, indicated with a red line here along this scanning line. You can see the silver peak here in the bonding region, also in the hybrid layer. Also at the bottom of the hybrid layer, a very high peak of the silver detected. It means that there is a space at the interface. This defect at the interface is believed to be the main cause of the degradation of the dentin bonding afterward. So when we test the bond strength after the uh, storage of the specimen in the water, uh, many of the specimen, in the case of the and rinse technique, showed the fracture at the bottom of the hybrid layer. So that means that hybrid layer may be a kind of the weak point of, at the interface. Again, I'll show you the uh, animation in the case of three-step system, etching, priming, bonding. The etching is the same. Phosphoric acid is very strong. And to prevent, to, to prevent, uh, to uh, re-expand the shrunk collagen layers, the prime application was uh, recommended. Of course, it was very effective to re-expand re the shrunk collagen layers. And the space among the fibers becomes bigger again. And the bonding resin can penetrate into this layer very well. However, the etching with phosphoric acid is too much aggressive. It is too deep for the bonding resin to penetrate up to the bottom of the demineralized layer. That's why there are some uh, dead uh, space existed, even after the polymerization. In the case of wet bonding technique, this is a nice idea to prevent the shrinkage of the collagen layers. We are recommended to maintain some amount of water to prevent the shrinkage. We should not dry the surface. The space among the fibers are maintained, and we apply the bonding resin. To remove the amount of the water at the interface, we are required to apply two times or three times. Then the amount of water will be decreased. Then we polymerize it. However, unfortunately, some water still remained at the interface in the bonding region as well as in the hybrid layer. That's why this interface is not so stable. Okay. Now, uh, nowadays, uh, we had so many kind of excellent papers on the bond strength test using many kind of adhesive materials. Also, many kind of bond test is applied. So many uh, clinicians, not only the clinicians and the researchers, are very much confused about the result of the bond test. Some paper showed 80 megapascal. The other paper says 20 megapascal, even with the same material. That is because of the difference of the test method. In this review paper, 147 papers were reviewed, and uh, they summarized the bond strengths according to the bond test method. This is the conventional uh, uh, shear bond test and the micro shear bond test with a much smaller surface area for bonding and conventional tensile bond test and micro tensile bond test. In any kind of bond test, almost the highest bond strengths were obtained with a Curie SC bond. That is the two step self etching adhesive material. So that's why, from this kind of analysis, the Free SC bond was recognized as the gold standard of the adhesive. 
So let's uh, consider about the bonding of this two-step self-hatching. This bond system consisted of one bottle self-hatching primer and one bottle adhesive, like this. In this self-hatching primer, the pH is adjusted around 2.0 because of this MDP. This is the acidic resin monomer. If you mix this acidic resin monomer in the aqueous solution, this phosphate part will be uh, ionized. That's why this solution becomes acidic. That's why we can etch enamel and dentin. That's why we need a small amount of water. However, the water cannot be polymerized. That's why after the application, we remove the excess of the primer by air blasting. Of course, HEMA, hydrophilic monomer, and hydrophobic monomers are incorporated. Again, the self-hatching primer can etch the tooth surface, and we expect the chemical reaction occurs between this monomer and the calcium ions from the uh, hydroxy apatite. pH 2.0 is strong enough to etch the surface of enamel and dentin. This is the pH of Coca-Cola. It's almost the same. And uh, orange juice and sports drink like this. But water, milk, and coffee, tea, they are almost at the neutral pH. OK? You must like this kind of drink. And uh, I already enjoyed a lot of kind of beer last night. And but however, the beer is actually acidic. There is no neutral pH of alcohol drink, unfortunately. And you may think that there is very important drink in Brazil. Uh, cachaça? <laughs> yes. Cachaça. I already enjoyed it. <laughs> it must be a little bit higher, like the whiskey. But uh, when we enjoy the cachaça, so some ladies were so kind to prepare the very special cocktail. What, what is the name of this cocktail? Caipirinha. Yes, I should remember this. Caipirinha. <laughs> so when you enjoy the cachaça, so you should make it very acidic. Okay. Acidic drink, acidic food is very tasty, very good. Anyhow, uh, I could enjoy this one very much. Because of this, I slept very well last night. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the two-step self-hatching. After the application of self-hatching primer, we remove the water from the primer, then we apply the bonding resin without water, without water. Again, it contains MDP, HEMA, dimethacrylate, BCGM, and FIRA, and catalyst. That's why we can create a very strong bond layer. Now, um, this MDP is uh, had been confirmed to create a very strong uh, chemical bonding with hydroxy apatite. So this kind of topic may be uh, presented by a Japanese young uh, researcher, uh, Dr. Yoshihara, in this program. Anyhow, the selection of the adhesive resin monomer is very important. Now I'll show you the animation of two-step self-hatching. The self-hatching primer is strong enough to remove most of the smear layer, and the very surface, superficial layer of dentin is demineralized. And this collagen is already treated with adhesive resin monomers. That's why it does not shrink at all. Then we apply the bonding resin. The bonding resin can penetrate into this demineralized layer very well, and we can like cure. And the hybrid layer at the interface, there is no weak point in this case. Of course, we evaluated the silver penetration at the interface. There was no silver penetrated. Because of this uh, less defect at the interface, the bonding is considered to be very stable even after long term storage in water. That's why dentin bond durability is always reported to be very good with this kind of bonding system. I can show you the um, schematic diagram of the interface in case of 
H and rinse type of adhesive, especially in the case of wet bonding technique, we, we observe this kind of uh, water and void at the interface. Of course, there is the naked collagen layers at the bottom of the hybrid layer. In the case of two-step self-hatching, there is no defect at this interface. Even with this kind of very excellent adhesives in the clinical situation, uh, we need to uh, consider about the secondary carries, recurrent carries, especially at the margin on the root surface. Okay? Uh, we tried to create the artificial secondary carries onto this uh, dentin margin. This is composite resin here and the bonding resin layer, and this is dentinal surface. Onto this area, we apply the very weak acid and the basic solution to create the secondary carries, artificial carries. Of course, the dentin is removed like this, and the artificial uh, secondary carries is created. The depth of the cavity is here. And when we observe this part very carefully, of course, we observe a very thin hybrid layer, and adjacent to this hybrid layer, we observe the dentin-like structure still remain even after acid and base sol basic solution attack. That's why we named this layer as super dentin. Dr. Nikaido, my colleague, named this uh, layer as super dentin, and the term of super dentin was already uh, accepted in the international journal. Okay, I, I hope Dr. Nikaido will uh, give lectures about this kind of interface. So this is the difference of the interface in case of H and rinse and the two self cell hatching, including the super denting formation. Unfortunately, the super denting is the product in the case of the self hatching material. In the case of H and rinse technique, the super denting cannot be created at the moment. In the case of one step system, this is designed to be very hydrophilic because the bonding resin itself has to etch the enamel and dentin surface. Of course, the source of the acid is the adhesive resin monomers. And the hydrophilic uh, matrix resin monomer is included, like HEMA, and hydrophobic monomers are also included in the bonding resin to make the bonding resin layer very strong, mechanically strong. And water is necessary to mix, uh, to, to make this solution as acidic. If there is no water, the monomer cannot be ionized. That's why we need small amount of water. Then we need to mix the water and oil. You can imagine the dressing of salada for salada. They are separated between the water water base and uh, oil based materials. That's why you have to shake it. So to mix these water and uh, oil based material, we need some kind of orga um, organic solvent like acetone or ethanol. Unfortunately, of course, this bonding resin can etch enamel and dentin, and it could penetrate into the surface layer. However, we cannot polymerize this water and solvent. That's why before you apply the light curing, these solvent and water should be removed from the interface. It is not so easy. This is an animation. Of course, the smear layer is mostly removed and very superficial layer is etched and the uh, bonding resin can penetrate. And the right, we try to remove water and solvent. However, some amount of water and solvent still remain at the interface. So that's why uh, sometimes under the SEM observation, we observe the void at the interface between bonding resin and composite, or sometimes in the bonding layer itself. However, in the case of one-step self-hatching system, it can create the super dentin, even though the thickness is very small. And unfortunately, the weakest point 
may be at this part in the case of one-step self-hatching. In the case of two-step self-hatching, to improve the bonding interface much more stable, so we need to detect the weakest point at the interface, even with two-step self-hatching. To analyze that weak point, we try to observe the initiation of the fracture during the bond test. And we try to observe under the high-speed recording. This is 1,000 frames per second and uh, 2,200, 6,600. like this. So beautiful movie. And we try to observe the bone test with high speed recording. This is the specimen for the micro tensile test for bonding, bonding evaluation. But it's not so easy to observe it. We, we utilize the laser pulse, laser pulse. The number of the pulse was 300,000 per second. That's why we could observe the fracture with the very high speed recording, 300,000 frames per second. It's an amazing number. And we prepared two kinds of specimens, that is two-step self-etching and the best wet bonding technique, that is ethanol wet bonding technique. As far as you apply a very appropriate ethanol wet bonding technique, probably it's not so easy. But if you can do that, it, the bonding must be the best in the case of HN rains. Okay. So this is the real time observation. Please uh, look at this part very carefully. Okay, it's still very fast. But we had 300,000 frames per second images. So unfortunately, our students have to evaluate frame by frame. <laughs> <laughs> so they could detect the fracture initiation uh, at the interface. Okay, we could uh, summarize the location of the fracture. In case of two-step self-hatching, the most percent, most fr uh, frequent fracture occurred at bond and composite interface. Look at this one. Okay. Of course, the initiation point was evaluated, and the second most frequent fracture occurred at bond layer in the bonding resin layer, like this. The same percentage. It is a mixture of this pattern. And 12% show the fracture in dentin. Okay. This is the result in case of two-step self-hatching. And in case of ethanol wet bonding, the most fracture occurred at the interface between bonding resin and dentin surface. This is debonding. And the second most was bond composite interface And here, bond composite interface and bond layer mixture, and 5% show the bond composite interface. Like this. Okay? Now I can show you in the case of ethanol wet bonding technique, the penetration of bonding resin into the demineralized denting was much better than the water uh, wet bonding technique. However, still the weak point is at the bottom of the hybrid layer or maybe at the interface between bonding resin and hybrid layer. This is a part of dentin. In the case of two-step self-etching, the weakest point was detected at the bonding resin layer itself or sometimes interface between composite and bonding resin. To improve this bonding, we need to increase the mechanical property of the bonding resin and we should increase the conversion between co-polymerization between bonding resin and composite resin. That's why the manufacturer tried, manufacturer tried to uh, improve the conversion, polymerization. 
by application of the new catalyst and uh, improved uh, composition of the matrix resin monomers. As a result, this new product, Creafi USC bond, was launched in recent years, and uh, fortunately, the modulus of the uh, bonding resin was improved very much, like this. And because of this, the durability of bonding was very much improved. Okay, I will move on. Now, the bond durability are uh, very so frequently uh, analyzed by many researchers in the world. Again, to improve the durability of bonding, we need to improve these factors, penetration and hardening, and some kind of chemical reaction to make it much more stable. Now, sometimes uh, in the case of HN rinse technique, um, the MMP is considered to be a very significant factor to uh, deteriorate the bond interface. However, the MMP is an issue uh, mostly only for the HN rinse technique. As far as you apply the self etching primer, that is much uh, less aggressive etching materials the MMP may not be an important uh, issue for the two-step self-hatching. Okay. Um, on the other hand, the fluoride containing adhesive resin system had been evaluated. And in general, it was confirmed to be very effective to uh, improve the durability of the bonding when the bonding resin can release fluoride after the bonding. In another study, again, we could confirm the very stable bonding, dentin bonding, in case of uh, fluoride releasing adhesive materials. So uh, not only fluoride, nowadays, uh, by from the uh, Shofu company, uh, they develop the so-called uh, surface pre-reacted glass ionomer filler particles. This SPRG filler is utilized for their adhesive resin as well as the composite resin and resin cement. After the polymerization, th this filler can release fluoride and boron and um, silicate, aluminum, and uh, strontium. So these uh, ions are considered to be very effective to enhance the remineralization and uh, sometimes um, the antibacterial effect. So this kind of material may be uh, said, categorized as the smart material or sometimes bioactive materials. So in the future, uh, this kind of function should, must be uh, incorporated into many of the adhesive and restorative materials. Now, in the clinical situation, we have to think about the bonding to the cavity floor. Cavity floor is a very so, complicated situation in the clinic. Okay. We could observe the gap formation in the cavity as a real-time observation using a new technology named optical coherence tomography, OCT. We prepare the cavity here, consists of enamel and dentin, and uh, we fill the composite after the bonding procedure, and we apply the light curing. Then we observe the interface. The author is uh, Juri Hayashi. She, she will present her paper in this program. Now we selected two kinds of adhesive system, one-step self-hatching, including the so-called universal bond, and two-step self-hatching material. Then we fill the cavity with a flowable composite as a bulk, two millimeter deep cavities. In this uh, observation, the, when the gap is created, we could see the very white line, okay? I will move it. After the bonding procedure, we fill the flowable composite. Then we start the light curing. 
like you started one second, two seconds, three, four, five seconds, six, seven, eight. Of course, it is polymerized already. Look at this part carefully. Now you see the white line indicating the gap formation during the light curing. Then even after the light curing, the gap still extended because of the residual stress in the composite. Okay, that's why we evaluated the gap afterwards. Of course, one step system, including uh, universal bonds, showed a higher percentage of the gap progress, and two step system showed very good results in case of denting gap. And enamel gap, again, the one step system showed the higher percentage of the gap progress. So from this kind of results, we have to think about the necessity of the selective etching of enamel in the case of self-etching materials. We had a very excellent clinical evaluation by Dr. Vart Famiavik from Belgium. Um, they evaluated the longevity and uh, longevity of the uh, restoration at the cervical region with and without the selective enamel etching in the case of QFUS C bond. So after uh, eight years of the restoration, both of the groups showed almost the same uh, percentage of the um, retention. So that's why we understand that for QFUS C bond and another kind of uh, two-step self etching material, selective phosphoric acid etching to enamel is not necessary. But in the case of one-step self-etching system, for most of them, the self-etching is recommended. Okay. Also, we have a new kind of uh, composite, a bulk fill composite. This is very, very at attractive for us. It must be very easy in the clinical situation. It is expected to be polymerized at the bottom of the cavity up to four millimeter, and at the same time, the low polymerization, polymerization shrinkage uh, is achieved. And of course, we need a high mechanical property and a high aesthetics. We should think about these factors if it is uh, true or not. In general, very attractive word, sometimes it's not true. Okay, we tested this material. Um, this is one of the so-called uh, bulk fill composite. And as a controller, we used the um, composite resin for core building up because this composite is very much transparent. We can um, polymerize at the bottom of the four millimeter cavity. And uh, another material is a kind of a dual cure type of uh, composite resin for core building up. Then we apply the best bonding procedure to the cavity made by the composite resin. We use the composite resin cavity because the four millimeter cavity, four millimeter deep cavity cannot be created, so prepared in the tooth. So anyhow, we could obtain a very good bonding and we feel it. And this side is the bottom of the cavity. Uh, this is one of the bulk fill composite. Then we apply the light. You can see the gap is propagated here during the light curing. OK, light care finish. So we summarize the result in case of uh, three kind of light cure type of bulk fill composite. It shows the gap like this, and the uh, core building up material shows this kind of percentage of the gap at the cavity floor. Dual cure type material showed the very good result regarding to the gap. In this case, we, we waited for 19 seconds before application of the light. It, that's why it takes a long time. It is not so easy to use it in the clinic. Anyhow, these materials showed the least uh, gap propagation at the cavity floor. And 
when we test, evaluate the conversion rate, degree of conversion at the bottom of the cavity, this material showed the least conversion. It means that less polymerization, less shrinkage stress. Okay, we need more, much better polymerization in this kind of material. That's why, unfortunately, at the moment, the most of the so-called bulk fill composite cannot work as we expected. But uh, the other kind of adhesive uh, um, composite resin materials were launched by many manufacturers. This is one of it. And the Tokuyama company had a very unique technology of the filler particles. They utilize the spherical filler particles and the size is 0.2 uh, micrometers. So um, because of the size of this filler particle, the polishing ability is so excellent. With a very, very simple uh, polishing technique, we can obtain very excellent polish. Uh, so, um, so very surface uh, gross with this kind of material. At the same time, this is very well designed to obtain good color matching even without multiple layering technique. Uh, because of the very excellent technology of the light diffusion effect. There is the disc of the composite with this material. Another material, it does not have the appropriate light diffusion effect. And behind this disc, we apply the light. Then we can see the light like this. The shape of the light can be observed very clearly in the case of this kind of material. But when the material has a very, ex very appropriate light diffusion effect, the shape of the light becomes very unclear. Because of this kind of effect, the margin between the restoration and tooth becomes so unclear, invisible margin. It looks very nice. And like this, this is a dentin di uh, composite resin disc. And when we apply the light, the light yield diffused through this kind of uh, materials. This is very nice. Uh, in the case of just single shade, you can obtain very good color matching. This is one of the so example. This is the artificial teeth for dentures. The shade is B1 to A3. In this artificial teeth, the cavity is prepared. And in those cavities, only A2 shade was filled. And it looks like this. This is after the filling of A2 shade. The color matches very well from B1 to A3. So this one and this one, B1 and A3, I placed B1 and A3 to the neighbor. And I will mask the other part. The color of the composite looks very different. This is very excellent chameleon effect because of light diffusion effect. So we can use this material in the clinical situation without the multiple lay shading, shade layering technique. This kind of technology helps us very much. Nowadays, uh, the mechanical property of the floral composite is becoming very high. That's why we can use, even for this kind of case, this case was done only with the floral resin composite. I'm sure there are many, many very excellent at, um, aesthetic dentists in this country. And this is one of the so, very excellent, the most excellent case. But unfortunately, this is not mine. My students, they have much better skill, and uh, their eyes much better than me. And my, anyhow, many of my staff members in my department enjoy this kind of restoration. OK, again, we have to think about this kind of issues, penetration and hardening and chemical reaction when we think about the future development of the material. Of course, we, ha we can learn from the history. My teacher, Dr. Takao Sayama, developed the innovative restoration technique. We can learn from the history. At that time, he tried to develop the caries detecting dye solution. 
Fortunately, he could find out a very simple procedure to indicate the caries with bacterial invasion. Then we just remove the bacterial invaded layer. The location of the bacterial invasion front is like this. Of course, the size of the pigment is much smaller than that of bacteria. That's why it can penetrate a little bit deeper than bacteria. Of course, the hydrogen ion uh, acid can penetrate much deeper. That's why this part, this line is the softening front. This part is softened already because of the penetration of hydrogen ion. It's because of the size of hydrogen ion, pigment, and bacteria itself. It's very simple. And we can preserve this transparent dentin with the occluded dentinal tubules and the reparative dentin formation. And we can remove only this part. This is the clinical procedure. We open the cavity with high-speed cutting, and uh, the natural discoloration is observed. And when we apply the dye solution, the area of stained area becomes bigger. Then we remove this stained dentin with slow speed uh, steel bar. After the removal, of course, the cavity floor dentin does not look so clean, but this is a typical appearance of the caries affected dentin without bacteria. Then we can bond it. Um, maybe some of you are very comfortable to apply the lining material before bonding. But um, we don't need to apply the lining material. In our society for conservative dentistry, they have the um, so working group to provide a guideline for caries treatment. It was firstly published in this kind of guideline book in 2009, and the result is um, published in the Journal of Dentistry in 2012. Now this uh, guideline was uh, renewed in recent years. I hope you to refer this. You can understand why the lining is not necessary for the adhesive restoration. Another very important information about the tooth is uh, shown here. Again, um, we published the paper using the um, optical coherence tomography. We evaluated 145 non caries cervical lesions with OCT. Very interesting information is like this. This is the so defect uh, non caries cervical lesion you can see here. This is the root dentin, this is the enamel side. And it, at here, you can see the white line. It indicates the separation between enamel and dentin at DEJ. It already happened. So this part of enamel may be uh, broken very easily. And also, the surface of the root dentin showed the slight demineralization. According to this kind of information, we can improve the procedure for bonding and restorations. If the surface is too much demineralized, we cannot obtain good bonding. That's why in that case, we would better to remove the surface of the demineralized dentin to obtain good, much better restoration. Now, this OCT is a very wonderful facility. Of course, we can evaluate all the old restorations in the mouth. Unfortunately, a considerable percentage of the restoration has the inadequate margin adaptation, 65%. This is not mine, okay? It's average Japanese restoration. And 27% uh, shows a large porosity in the restoration like this. And gap formation was observed in 15% of the restorations. So in the future, all the restoration will be visible so we can evaluate our restoration and we can improve our, the quality of the restoration. Now this is a, my old case, and the patient was more than 60 years old, female patient. I thought 60 years old lady, it's okay with this kind of diastema. But after 
I became 60 years old, I thought it was a serious problem. <laughs> Even though I don't have enough hair, every day I face to the mirror to check my face. Okay? So, and, but unfortunately, she could not accept any kind of treatment options from the dentist. Orthodontics and uh, uh, crown bridge restoration and so on. But anyhow, she, she wished to close this window. Okay? And after one week, after one week, the window was closed. Okay? It's very simple. I just uh, bonded the composite tooth, composite, direct composite. And I requested my patient to make this incisor a little bit smaller. That's it. Like this. Very excellent. Like this. And this part, I bonded this composite with the like your composite. Oops. Four years and uh, 12 years already. It works very well. This is really the problem-based dentistry, okay? It's not so much complicated just to um, solve the problem of our patient. We don't need to apply the full mass restoration to this kind of patient. Again, this is an old patient in our department clinic. The patient came back to our clinic after nearly um, several years, and she complained about the restoration. According to the treatment record card, it was the two, 12 years old crown. She didn't like this marginal area. And there was a composite resin painting here. Nine years composite resin veneer. So the patient said she liked this one, but she didn't like that. Okay. So sometimes the ceramist and the so-called prostodontist uh, criticize that composite resin is a kind of uh, temporary restoration. Of course, we can say that this is the long-lasting temporary restoration. Okay. And this is, we can say that this is very expensive temporary restoration. Okay. Now I think not only by the development of the material itself, the paradigm shift of the dentist and the dental clinicians is required from the discipline-based dentistry to the problem-based dentistry. It's not so much complicated to just solve the problem of a patient. Then I can show you this kind of uh, cycle of the teeth. In the past time, when we had a very small restoration, it becomes bigger and bigger, endo, fracture, and bridge, implant, and denture. Now, if we very carefully follow up the restoration, the restoration can be maintained as small as mu much as possible. Then, I mean, <laughs> of course, the restoration has the longevity, but we should accept that our life is also temporary. As far as our restoration can maintain in our whole life, it is categorized as a permanent restoration. Okay. Now, I hope you to enjoy the adhesive dentistry and you can create the future. And now we are very happy to have many members, uh, including uh, the Brazilian student at the moment. So uh, in the future, we can uh, so develop our collaboration much more than now. And I hope the young people, you can create the future of adhesive dentistry. I thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Tagami. I'm going to uh, open now 
Thank you for the excellent lecture. And now I'm going to open for the questions and discussions. We have some time left before coffee break. So please. Does anyone want to make questions for Dr. Tagami? Feel free to ask. If you want to ask in Portuguese, we can talk to him later. enamel, dentin, and many kind of restorative materials, like ceramic and metal, and so on, with just the same bottle of the adhesive. And, but um, the bonding to the ceramic material is not so easy. One of the so-called universal bond, it is uh, said to be the siren is already activated with acidic resin monomers in the bottle. And the other material I recommend us to mix the silent coupling agent and with the bonding resin material. So it is so uh, activated immediately after the mixing. It works very well. When we test the bond, te bond strength to the old composite material, the so-called universal bond could not provide the so durability of bonding to the composite. Probably that silent coupling did not work so well. So that's why, unfortunately, um, universal bond is also very attractive. However, we cannot rely on that kind of performance. And also, universal means what is the meaning? Multi huh? mode. Multi mode? Yeah. Uh -huh, yes. <laughs> Multi mode. Yes, um, as I showed you already, uh, the so-called one-step self-hatching material, including a universal bond, it does not provide the good uh, bonding at the margin of enamel margin cavity, uh, as well as the bottom of the cavity, that is de in the denting uh, cavity floor. So, uh, but, the bonding can be applicable in the clinical situation. In the clinical situation, you may not uh, have any problems. But to make that bonding much more reliable, I recommend you to apply the flowable composite resin lining onto the bonding layer. So after you apply the bonding resin, one-step system, um, universal bond, and you apply the right curing. Still, the polymerization of the universal bond, one-step system, is not uh, enough because the situation, the, the environment of the bonding region is very acidic. So that's in that kind of acidic condition, the polymerization is not so easy. That's why if you apply the composite onto that surface, the shrinkage stress can very easily broken the bonding. The bond strength immediately after the light curing is not enough. That's why we apply the flowable composite onto that surface and apply the light curing. Then the bond strength becomes much higher. So we recognize the procedures including bonding resin application, light cure, flowable composite application, light cure. These procedure should be uh, included as a bonding procedure in the case of one-step self-hatching. Then we can obtain very good searing at the cavity floor and the cavity walls. Then you can move on to the filling, uh, incremental filling technique of any kind of composite. That is my understanding because of from our um, so research. Thank you. Anyone else? No? 
So I'd like to thank yeah. once again thank Dr. Tagami much. for the lecture. I'm going to give you the certificate, and Dr. Marcelo will give you a present for this meeting. Before coffee break, eu gostaria de dar um recado para o pessoal que veio. Tem dois carros que precisam de atenção, um parece que está com o vidro aberto. É o FLZ 5444, eu acho que é isso, é que eu não estou entendendo nada. E o outro é o FJJ 2020. Por gentileza, se vocês puderem uh, dar uma olhadinha, porque parece que um está com o vidro aberto e eu não tenho certeza se está chovendo. Okay. Now I invite everyone to the coffee break. We're going to return 15 to 11. Thank you. Oi? Ah, tá. Eu já avisei. Será que fala de novo? Tá. Antes da Cintia, eu falo de novo.
Não, ela não deixou aqui. Escuta aqui, ó. para a gente confirmar se está passando. Põe, põe só para ver se... Já é. É? Volta. Se eu apertar errado e apagar, você sai correndo, Gabriel.
Can we move forward? Is everyone here? Can we begin the next presentation, please? Now, for the next presenter, we have Dr. Cynthia Pereira Machado Tabshuri, uh, who is going to present Carries Development Adjacent to Restorations. Can fluoride release and material control it? I welcome Dr. Cynthia to come forward. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Cynthia uh, uh, Tabshuri is the Associate Professor of the Department of Physi Physiological Sciences of the Cardiology Division and Coordinator of the Graduate Programs of Piracicaba Dental School of University of Campinas. Dr. Cynthia, thank you so much for the presentation. And now you have the word. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, students and professors. First, I would like to deeply thank Professor Janini for believing in me and in my work, for kindly inviting me to participate as a lecturer in this successful event, and for being a great colleague in all these years. I would like to take this chance to thank Piracicaba Dental School which gave me many chances in my academic life and supported me to achieve what I have achieved. Okay, let's work. My topic today is caries development adjacent to restorations. Can fluoride releasing materials control, control it? Um, our aim here today is to answer a simple question. Can fluoride releasing material control caries development adjacent to restorations? However, before answering it, I consider that it's relevant to present some contemporary concepts about dental caries and also how fluoride works to control this disease. There, these new concepts are important because they uh, have impact either on how the anti-caries potential of fluoride releasing material has been evaluated and on the understanding about their clinical limitation to prevent caries. Our, con our concepts about caries and fluoride are still separated by dogmas and myths, which I represent here by this red, red line, red column. One of the central paradigms in cariology is, then, is that caries is a transmittable infectious disease. Caries is not a classical infectious disease. The other paradigm that we need to talk about is the mechanism of action of fluoride. Talking about caries first, the Lesions develop on dental surfaces in which biofilms are formed, allowed to accumulate and retained for long periods of time. Although necessary, biofilm accumulation alone is not enough. We must be aware of that. Dietary sugars or carbohydrates are the determinant negative factors responsible for caries lesions initiation and progression. Caries lesions are in fact found in some dental surface where biofilm accumulate, such as occlusal surfaces, interproximal areas, along the gingival margin, and on exposed enamel cemental junction. And uh, however, we should add here the areas adjacent to the dental surfaces, sealed or restored with dental materials. With regard to sugars, they are the necessary factor responsible for caries lesion progression. Caries results from an ecological shift in the tooth surface biofilm, leading to a mineral imbalance between plaque fluid and tooth, and hence net loss of tooth mineral. Take a look at this pH curve here that we have, the pH drop over the time. And uh, the acid pH produced from the fermentation of dietary sugars by the bacteria presented in the dental biofilm 
besides provoking dissolution of the underneath dental minerals, also select the most carogenic bacteria in the biofilm format. Therefore, caries is a biofilm sugar dependent disease and among the dietary sugars, sucrose is the most carogenic carbohydrate. It is easily fermented to acids and is the only substrate for synthesis of extracellular polysaccharide. A bio, uh, this extracellular polysaccharide is this polymer that we can see between the bacteria here in this picture compared to this one. These polysaccharides, they change the matrix of this biofilm. They change the composition and they change it how it behaves. Considering the biofilm, uh, it, like I already, I already said, it is the necessary factor for caries progression in any dental surface, either an intact surface or a restored surface, as we show here in this picture, a restored surface with biofilm formed over it. Biofilms form naturally on the surfaces, either intact or uh, surface adjacent to fillings. The only difference between caries progression adjacent to a filling in comparison with an actual surface is the possibility of biofilm accumulation in the gap between the wall of the cavity and the filling material. Thus, we can conclude from this part of my presentation that caries lesions progression on dental surfaces, restored or not, is provoked by the same factors, biofilm accumulation and frequent sugar exposure. Considering the physical chemical process of caries, uh, it is the same in any dental surface. Every time the sugar either sucrose, fructose, or glucose is ingested. Acids are produced by the biof biofilm bacteria, and consequently, the pH drop in the biofilm, which we can see here. There is a pH drop when the sugars are metabolized by the bacteria. And uh, as long as the pH stays below 5.5 for NAMO and 6.5 for dentine, as we show here, the minerals of these tissues are dissolved and the tooth will be subjected to the physical chemical process of demineralization. After around 20 to 30 minutes, we have the pH uh, rising again and in a pH higher than 5.5 for enamel and 6.5 for dentine, saliva tries to repair the amount of calcium and phosphate lost. As we all know, saliva is supersaturated in relation to calcium and phosphate and has remineralizing properties. The physical chemical process here called, is called remineralization. However, saliva alone is not 100% effective. And then fluoride plays a key role in the prevention and control of dental caries. There is no doubt that the discovery of the anti-caries properties of fluoride was one of the most important landmarks in the history of dentistry. The current concept is that the effect of fluoride is post-eruptive and local. Fluoride must be in the right place, at the right time, in the right amount. And its mechanism of action has to do with reducing demineralization and enhancing remineralization. Um, so fluoride does not avoid the formation of biofilm in any dental surface, does not prevent caries by making teeth more strong, more resistant, and does not inhibit the bacteria from the biofilm from metabolizing sugar into acid. 
fluoride interferes with the caries process, reducing the demineralization and enhancing remineralization. So, like I said, the mechanism is physical chemical. And every time that sugar is ingested, we have these two uh, processes occurring. First, the pH falls in the biofilm. And if fluoride is present, the amount of mineral dissolved is reduced because part of the calcium and phosphate lost as hydroxyapatite returns to the tooth as fluorapatite. When the ingestion of sugar is interrupted, the pH rises again and fluoride is present and if fluoride is present, it enhances the phenomenon of remineralization. We can see these two uh, situations occurring here. Here, when the pH falls, we lose hydroxyapatite, but we gain fluorapatite, so the net mineral loss is diminished. And here, when the pH rises again, we have both the positions of hydroxyapatite and fluorapatite. So this way, fluoride is able to activate this remineralization. Dental materials are used in dentistry for many clinical purposes, but when the aim is to repair the damage provoked by caries in enamel or dentine, materials classified as preventive or restorative can be used. Fluoride releasing restorative materials are seen as very attractive by the clinicians because they could serve double purpose. Besides repairing carriers or defective teeth, they could also help prevent the develop of new caries lesions. Fluoride releasing materials should be considered a way to maintain fluoride constantly in the mouth if the material used to rebuild the tooth does not have properties to control caries adjacent to the filling. The role of this material is only to make again the tooth functional and aesthetically desirable to the patient. However, when dental materials that release fluoride are used, as illustrated in this slide here, it is expected that besides their clinical performance, the material has properties to control the, recurrent, the recurrence of caries on dental structure. In addition to restorative materials, we must say that dental caries preventive prevention can be obtained by different ways of fluoride use, like community level, self-use, professional, and the mechanism of action of how fluoride works to control caries is essentially the same, irrespective of the way that we are using fluoride. The mechanism of action is the same. Uh, we might include here fluoride releasing materials as a professional way. Among these ways of using fluoride, toothbrushing with fluoride toothpaste is the only vehicle to deliver fluoride in the mouth, whose results on caries reduction are strongly based on evidence. Fluoride toothpaste have been widely used for over three decades and remain a benchmark intervention for the prevention of dental caries. Considering the results of this review that I show here in this slide, the benefits of fluoride toothpaste are firmly established and supported by more than half a century of research. Taken together, the trials included in this review here are of relatively high quality and provide clear evidence that fluoride toothpaste containing concentrations equal or higher to 100 ppm of fluoride are efficacious in preventing caries. Besides, its effectiveness to control the incidence of caries in originally intact dental surfaces, fluoride toothpastes could also interfere with caries lesion progression adjacent to fillings or other dental materials. Because during tooth brushing, fluoride is spread throughout the mouth 
and remainings of biofilm that were not perfect, perfectly removed can be enriched with fluoride, as illustrated in this slide here. In addition, considering the background showed here about dental caries and fluoride, effect to control the disease, we will see now some data about the effectiveness of fluoride releasing materials on caries. This figure here shows the hierarchy of evidence about, about effectiveness. Every intervention in health should be based on the best available evidence, but the only way to know if it works in real life is running randomized clinical trials, which are shown here as a high level of evidence. Of course, we should study with more simple uh, experiments like animal studies, in vitro research, we also need the case series, but uh, for saying that a treatment is really uh, the way that we should treat that disease, we need to have randomized clinical trials. So what kind of research should be conducted, considering here our topic? Uh, the research should follow a rational hierarchy starting from positive, simple results of in vitro fluoride releasing. In vitro and in situ studies about the anti-caries effect of fluoride released should also be included. And finally, justifying that a clinical trial should be done. The most extensive review about fluoride releasing materials was published in 2007 and showed that fluoride releasing material may act as a fluoride reservoir and may increase the fluoride level of saliva, plaque, and dental hard tissues. However, we might here discuss the relevance of fluoride in saliva and fluoride in dental hard tissues for the prevention of caries. Consider what we have already talked about fluoride here. So of course fluoride is going to be in saliva and also in dental hard tissue, but we need fluoride in, uh, in a room, in a place that it is really going to work like plaque, plaque fluid, the biofilm. The present manuscript reviewed 253 papers and concluded that these materials have potential to control caries adjacent to fillings. However, it is not proven by prospective clinical studies whether the incidence of recurrent caries can be at the present significantly reduced by the fluoride release of restorative materials. Another review published last year had similar results and uh, they concluded that there is at this moment no evidence to recommend fluoride releasing feelings regard to caries control adjacent to restoration. In other words, if fluoride releasing materials are clinically effective on caries control, it's, a, it's a still a dogma. But based on large numbers of in vitro and in situ studies conducted, they should work. Here we have a study that was conducted by a former student here from Piracicaba Dental School. The they evaluated the release of fluoride and aluminum, which uh, has antibacterial properties, over 15 days of pH in pH cycling solutions. We must remember that caries is a chronic disease, and the process of caries lesions progression occurs every day, every time. 
Thus, fluoride should be present constantly in the mouth to interfere with the caries process. And consequently, the releasing should be evaluated for longer times because fluoride does not work as a vaccine, does not make the tooth stronger, as I already said. We can observe here in this graphic that there is a higher release of fluoride and aluminum in the first days, and then it is lowered down. Another study that was conducted here in the laboratory, um, in our biochemistry laboratory, and uh, it is shown here, and we must be aware that our mouth is an open sink that does not concentrate the cumulative effect of ions released from dental materials. Therefore, I study, this study was conducted during a discipline for graduate students to confirm the relevance of the combination effect of fluoride and aluminum. Enamel blocks were restored with a composite resin as a negative control or with a material that releases mainly fluoride and another material that releases high amounts of fluoride and aluminum. In this short-term study, uh, the, we evaluated the effect of fluoride and aluminum released on the reduction of demineralization around the filling material. The restored slabs were placed in contact with a uh, um, kind of a biofilm, a mass of bacteria of Streptococcus mutants, and the appliances were subjected to sucrose solution, and the effect of fluoride from the material was evaluated. And here in this uh, figure, we can see the amount of mineral loss from the three materials that were tested. And we can um, clearly see that both materials that release fluoride were able to prevent mineral loss. We also analyzed, of course, the fluoride present in the test plaque, what we call, it's not a real biofilm, and we also evaluated fluoride in enamel, and we can see that both uh, fluoride releasing materials can increase fluoride in this test plaque and also on enamel. Subsequently, another study was conducted and it is a in situ study with the durations of 14 days and human teeth which were restored with composite resin or glass ionomer modified with resin. The dental slabs were placed in a palatal appliance. The biofilm was allowed to accumulate in, in the, in, over the slabs and the slabs were treated eight times a day with 20% sucrose solution. The study was conducted in four phases, and we had the use of fluoride, and uh, we had some slabs uh, here that used non-fluoride dentifrice, and here some slabs that were treated with fluoride dentifrice. So we had these two situations and uh, the biofilm was formed, the biofilm was collected, and the slabs were analyzed for uh, mineral loss. And here we have some results. The fluoride formed in the bi the, the fluoride found in the biofilm formed, and here we can see that we have a greater amount of fluoride in both uh, over the materials that release fluoride, either when the, then the volunteers used non-fluoride dentifrice and when the volunteers used fluoridated dentifrice. However, the concentration found here in this biofilm is not enough to inhibit formation of biofilm, is not enough to have an antibacterial effect. What we have here is the physical chemical action of fluoride acting in the remineralization and in the demineralization. 
And here we have the results of the mineral loss. First, in enamel, and we can see that the, release, the fluoride releasing material can really have an impact on this mineral loss. However, when we have the use of fluoride dentifrice, there is no difference between both materials. And we have uh, almost the same results when we talk about dentine. The fluoride releasing material has potential to inhibit mineral loss. However, when fluoride dentifrice is used regularly, it does not have a difference from this other material that does not release fluoride. So, in conclusion, with my presentation, I would like to say that caries lesion progression on dental surfaces, either if the surface is restored or not restored, it is provoked by the same factors. We need to have biofilm accumulation that is a necessary factor, and we need to have frequent sugar exposure that is the determinant negative factor. Fluoride releasing materials fill up all the attributes to be effective on caries control. They release fluoride that it is in the right place at the right amount to have some effect. However, whether they are clinically effective on caries control is still a dogma. We need more randomized clinical trials to prove it. So its effect on caries also at the present time may be overwhelmed by the same effect that fluoride from toothpaste has. So at last, I would like to thank the biochemistry laboratory of this institution. I would like to thank Professor Jaime Cudi, who was my supervisor during my master and my PhD, who helped me to achieve many conquers in my academic life, who is still a mentor during all these years that we are working together, and who was the inspiration, I would say, and also the basic reference for this presentation. I also would like to thank the technicians of our laboratory, Valdomiro, who is still retired, who is already retired, and Alfredo. And a special thanks to Professor Altair, who believed in me almost 20 years ago and in, invested and, in, in, and said that I should go and change and pursue this academic life. Thank you all for this. Thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm open to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cinta, for the wonderful lecture. I will now open for questions I think you might have. Okay. Anyone? I'm going to ask a question, can I? <laughs> okay. Uh, from what you presented, uh, it seems that, as we know, ionomer base, glass ionomer based materials are far way more uh, significant in releasing fluoride than um, composite based materials, although we are always pursuing to change the composite's composition. Uh, to increase the fluoride amounts and to uh, try other um, ways to remineralize the dentin, the, the caries affected dentin. How do you see these improvements that we try to bring to composites, the, the manufacturers try to do? Uh, do you think that if we have higher amounts of fluoride in the composite, they might have a better performance, or should they be rechargeable as ionomer-based ion materials? It's something like that. What do you see as a future for the composites? Oh, thank you for your question, Vanessa. I think that was my also my question during the time that I prepared my presentation. 
Uh, I, I believe that dental materials have a lot of potential to work and to be a, a very important point in dentistry. And I think it, uh, there was a lot of evolution in recent years. We have space for more evolution and maybe the, the firms and can work more on that. I think both are important, that you have a good amount of fluoride in the material, but it, it may be, it is good to have a rechargeable property because it can uh, gain fluoride when the patient uh, brushes the teeth, for example, and then during the day when the patient is not brushing the teeth, fluoride is going to be slowly released to the environment. Uh, I, I, th I think that is the way that things should, the research should go. But uh, I think there is a long way, but we are in the right one. Thank you. Anyone else? Please. Dr. Braga. Cynthia, thank you for the presentation. Uh, when question that I always uh, had, and I'm going to take the opportunity that you were there <laughs> to ask, about the recharging effect. If the fluoride that is uh, released after recharging is from the toothpaste, does it need to be glass ionomer or any other material could retain this fluoride and then release it um, after some time? Yeah. I'm, I'm not an expert on dental materials, so Professor Giannini put me in this position, <laughs> but I'm not that person. But I, I think that any other material that could retain fluoride and then release it would be interesting for the caries process. The idea is that you have fluoride in very low amounts. You don't need to have a great amount of fluoride but you need to have it constantly during the day. So it, it really does not have to be glass ionomer. It could be any other material that could have fluoride and then be recharged when you brush your teeth. Because uh, even if you have a material with high amounts of fluoride, it is going to release fluoride and then at some point it does not have any more fluoride to release. So maybe thinking the rechargeable property would be very interesting. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you did. The only thing is that I have a problem with the term recharging. Yes. Because you're not recharging. You're yes. just like depositing Deposit. fluoride on the yes. surface yes. and then but it's being released. Not, maybe not in the surface. Maybe you are depositing fluoride, but it needs to be deposited in a way that it could also uh, l release it, not deposit and keep it, but deposit and release it. And maybe, uh, maybe we can see in your presentation that it's maybe not just fluoride, maybe other ions could be interacting together. Uh, I showed some results about aluminum. Aluminum and, and fluoride make a good, um, a good, um, good way of improving the effect because aluminum has some antibacterial properties. So if fluoride in that amount does not have any antibacterial property, maybe other ions could help improve this effect. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. No? Come on, you can be. You can ask questions in Portuguese. It's okay, okay, or Japanese. <laughs> not not Japanese. <laughs> yeah, I try to uh, ask a question in English. So thank you very much. So I'm Toru Nikaido from Tokyo Medical and Dental University. So uh, you mentioned about the in the future uh, materials about the composite. So the uh, there is two strategies to put the fluoride into the uh, composite restoration. One is the uh, uh, fluoride releasing composite, and uh, another one is the uh, fluoride releasing adhesive. So the, in the restoration, so that is a combination. So which is uh, more uh, powerful to uh, 
prevent the caries? <laughs> Difficult question. <laughs> yeah, I believe we can combine the effects. Uh, up to the moment, we have no evidence about that, but maybe uh, different ways of trying to improve it, re it's that release of fluoride would be good. So I think we should combine. I think we still should combine because we still have caries going on. Even though we know a lot about the disease, we are not able to stop it. We are not able to inhibit it. So I really believe that we should combine. Maybe composite and adhesives would be a good strategy. Thank you. Anyone? So, no? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna thank once more for the wonderful the lecture doc Dr. Cynthia gave us. And now I'm gonna give her the certificate and Dr. Kagami will give you the present. Thank you so much. We have a message from Dr. Nima that the oral presentation number four, Casu Hiku Shibuya, just give us the, the lecture later on so we can upload in the computer. Okay. Now we're going to have a time for lunch time, and there is the mall that is right uh, across the, the university. Please take care of crossing this avenue. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. And then we get back at 1.30? 1.30 p.m. Everybody here to go on. Is there any other message? No? So have a very nice lunch, and we'll be here very soon. Thank you.